Antonella, let's start with you. Who is responsible for the astronaut selection process? Who takes part in the various uh, selection phases? Can you tell us a few words about that? Yes. So this selection, as you all can imagine, is quite unique and also quite complex. Um, and for this reason, there is a really multidisciplinary team which is contributing uh, to the different phases of the selection itself. Uh, there are, for example, colleagues responsible uh, for um, several aspects of the human exploration program. There are the trainers, so uh, the trainers who uh, work uh, daily with astronauts who prepare them for their missions. Uh, there are astronauts, so they will be also very actively participating and supporting us. There are medical doctors, of course, and HR, so human resources. Uh, for specific activities like psychological and psycho psychometric tests, we can also rely on the support uh, of experienced external partners. And uh, let's not forget that at the end, uh, the astronauts who will be successful will be appointed by ESA uh, Director General. So it means that uh, also our Director General is quite uh, heavily involved in the process and uh, he will make his final decision. All in all, it, what is important for each one of us participating to this is uh, to strive for uh, an unbiased recruitment process. Um, and this is why we will count on a diverse selection committee in terms of background, but also age, nationality and gender. Okay, that's very clear. Thank you very much, uh, Antonella. I have another question really linked to, to that. In view of this um, current situation and the pandemic, of course, I'm sure that a lot of participants wonder if they will have to travel for a taking test, which phases of the selection are going to be remote take or face to face can you tell us yes so um, the selection process foresees after the application time uh, and the screening phase five different stages and apart from the screening all further phases are foreseen to be uh, happening face to face so this means that the applicants who will make it through the first part which is uh, the screening they will be uh, actually invited to travel to different uh, european destination for uh, the different uh, selection uh, parts. Of course, we are fully aware and we are taking into account uh, the current um, situation of the pandemic and um, we are following it very closely. So it means that if we will have to uh, delay uh, some of the activities because uh, of travel restrictions, for example, we will um, in, be in contact with the candidates. So uh, don't worry, uh, we will get back to you and you will always be informed because our aim is to have, as I said, all faces basically face to face and to meet you uh, as much as possible. What are the main characteristics the skills, the expertise an astronaut should have. What I would like to say is that uh, it, we are not talking about a common profile, so it's not really easy to uh, summarize what we are looking for uh, and uh, what an astronaut is. Um, I can therefore only uh, describe to you what I think uh, are the, the major uh, characteristics that I would like to find in the candidates who will be become then ESA astronauts. So ESA is a very intercultural and uh, interdisciplinary uh, agency. So this is why we uh, are really looking for people who are curious and motivated and who really love to work uh, with a variety of uh, colleagues coming from uh, different backgrounds and nationalities. Then an astronaut should be um, ready to um, summarize and assimilate rapidly uh, a huge amount of information and to be able it should also be able to uh, remain calm under stress um, then we also may imagine working hours can be very irregular and i only believe that you can uh, overcome this uh, with a really strong uh, and high level of what of personal motivation and then uh, one of the major aspects for me is that um, it is essential to work in a team, um, but when and if necessary, uh, an astronaut should be ready to take the lead. So uh, we look for leaders, but uh, 
also for very good team members. And I think this is the balance which is uh, crucial for an astronaut. <clears throat> Effectively, what we are looking when we are searching for astronauts are actually really people who can um, take a load of activity. There is a lot of work to do to become an astronaut. And when you are an astronaut in a mission, there is a lot of work. There is a lot of flexibility. There are, as, you, as Antonia said, there is a lot of uh, the, um, many, the, the, the normal working time is not something that is really observed. There is a lot of travel which are involved, a lot of training and training happening in every country around the world. Oh, no, not every country, but at least with the, the five partners which are involved in, this, in the International Space Station. So that's quite demanding. And so it requires a lot of resistance, both physical and intellectual also. Uh, it requires a lot of flexibility. It requires a very good support also from the family. It, it's something where it's not an adventure that you are doing alone. That's something where you need support. And uh, it's very important that uh, if for the people who are uh, in a couple, they have also the support of the other half. That's really essential. Uh, the family is a is really something which is helping in that in that work uh, tremendously. We need people who need who are in good health for reasons that I might explain later, but which are pretty self-explanatory too. We are sending people in space where they will be without any capacity of medical inter intervention. So we need to have people who are in good health. What does that mean? But exactly that we need to have people in general good health doesn't mean that we are looking for perfect people or perfect health it doesn't exist and the same thing the same way it doesn't um, or the perfect astronaut does not exist and that's the reason why we are sometimes seems to be a bit reluctant defining strong or very strict criteria it's something which we do not work, work that way. We, we really try to have another look at the astronauts and to find the people who have the, the right profile as an ensemble, not as a detail. And the same thing, we also recruiting a team of astronauts. We are not recruiting only one, we will recruit several. And this class of astronauts needs to be able to work together first before they have to go in, in as part of a crew in a space mission. So it's very important that we find people who are complementary and we also have, we also have complementary skills so that we can find the right person to assign to a specific mission. We do not send any astronaut to every mission. That doesn't happen that way too. So it's a, it's a bit fuzzy in terms of definition. I fully understand that. But actually, we do have, by experience, a pretty good idea of what kind of, who, could, who can fit and who will not be able. That's, um, that's also the, the role of the, uh, of the selection committee. And that's the reason why there is not one single man taking, taking all the decisions. There are many people because we need to have a multidisciplinary plural point of view on the, uh, on the candidates to really perform that selection. Uh, so, um, um, Guillaume has already explained it very well. Um, we, we, we look for leaders as well as followers. We look for people who can, who, who are calm under stress, who know what it means to, to be perhaps away from social life for, for, for periods or long period of time, who can still operate under, under such circumstances, who are, um, yes, we look for um, um, people who can really um, how to say, uh, work in extreme conditions, um, under yeah. extreme conditions. And, okay. and that is something that will be then later when the person has been also selected, of course, then also um, uh, in, as part of the training, tested and so on, where people will be exposed to um, extreme um, extreme weather conditions and so on, where you then uh, also have to cope and survive in, this, in, 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 these, in these situations. Um, but at the time of the selection process, we will already do a lot of psychological testing and that's what I mentioned also earlier. And, and um, this, this is very important that we have these, um, we are not looking for the absolute supermen and superwomen, okay? We are not looking for that, but we are looking for people who, who can cope with these kind of situations. And yeah. it might well be that your current life that you have with a lot of stress that we are also facing with COVID or stress that we are facing with the um, taking care of children and taking care of the of families and everything that already gives you that experience and that will be tested during the selection process of course whether you are capable of doing and enduring that so yes that is we are looking really for this broad uh, broad skill set and that's why the, the requirements the 
are really the, the minimum requirements are really only three. They are they are strict. There we are strict, but on the rest we are far more open. We have these these um, asset criteria that are good to have, but not requirements. Not but there are three minimum requirements that everybody needs to bring at the time of the application. Because I get a lot of um, questions on that from the previous sessions that whether I have that in the future. No, it is at the time of application you need to fulfill these minimum requirements, and there are only three, but the rest are asset criteria. So that's, I just wanted to pass that message to everybody. Quite some questions apparently on the medical conditions, the medical certificate, uh, the uh, visual impairment, eyesight. Can you try to briefly say us something about that? It's not a real question, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a global question again. Can you say something beyond? Uh, I can briefly explain, yeah. When we do uh, uh, when we do an asset selection, as I said, we look for people in good health in general. Um, the reason why we are asking for this medical aeromedical certificate is that the standards which are used for private pilots uh, doesn't mean that if you people who can receive can pass the exam and have received a medical certificate, they will be as good as needed to be as not, but at least those who will not be fit for becoming pilot. We are almost sure that we won't, they will not be fit to be to become an astronaut. So it's at the same time uh, uh, a time saver for for us because we will not have to perform a complete selection and then the medical test at the end on the person who will not be able to become astronauts on one side, but that's also a time saver for and cost saver for the people themselves, because then they will not have to engage into a selection in which at the end they have no chance. And so again, we are not looking for an expert for, for a perfect, um, for perfect health, it, I say it doesn't exist. But we are looking for someone who, for people, at least for several persons who are in good health in general. We will perform medical investigation and medical evaluations around the end of the selection, not the last step, but uh, the fourth for last. That will be uh, quite extensive medical information. And the reason for that is that we need to have, uh, and to first of all, to ensure the safety of the person when we send them to a space mission. Again, as I said, we will not be able to provide a very strong medical support, medical intervention when the people are in the space station or even further in once in their career, they go up to the moon. Uh, and so it's very important for us to at least rely on a good health status as a, as a start. Uh, the, the second reason is, uh, yeah, we need to assess safety and we also need for the agency, we will invest a lot of time in training and selecting the persons. And we also want to, to make sure that we can look together with this person toward a career as an astronaut, which is 10, 15, 20 years. And for that, it's also important for us to understand how, how is the, the health status. So with regard to eyesight, I know that's a question which is very, very uh, often uh, asked. We can have, we can be an astronaut when you, with glasses. It's not a showstopper. What okay. we do have as, uh, as a limitation is the uh, the strength of the, uh, the the correction. We cannot go to extreme correction. And there are very good physiological reasons for that. We are putting the, the persons in conditions which are not standard on Earth. Mm -hmm. And the eye is a very sensible organ. We can sometimes have very, uh, very strong reactions to this environment. So we don't want to put them at a risk. And it's also for us and for the mission very risky to have someone who is becoming impaired visually impaired during a mission. So that's the reason we ask for a certain level of eyesight. We ask for a good color vision, and that's a very strong showstopper there. And we okay. ask also for a good depth perception. So the, the, the relief is, has to be also perceived. So that's, and, but if you can obtain a private pilot medical certificate, there are very, limited risk that you would not be able to pass the uh, the medical examination for the for, for at least individual aspect that's from a from a nice side in terms of uh, correctivity or refra a refraction point of view of course there are some ocular disease which can happen but i don't want to enter into this debate that's beyond the scope of that uh, of that discussion 
So the, the criteria are not extremely severe, not as severe as it is thought in most of the population. We, are, we have mostly evolved in the last 60 years since space medicine has been created. So many people who are simply in good health can and can get their medical certificate for private pilot, can apply, and um, they have also good chances. You are having a lot of questions. If we do not, or if we have not answered them, please do not hesitate to refer to the uh, frequently asked questions to the uh, applicant's uh, handbook and also to write to us to astronaut.recruitment at ESA.int. Is uh, a language certificate, the English language certificate, needed and uh, does it have to be provided at the time of application? Uh, no, we are requesting a certain level of knowledge for the English language, which is uh, the C1. But we are not asking candidates to upload a proof of their uh, level of knowledge. And uh, the same applies for any additional language which uh, the candidate might know. So we are not requesting any specific certificate to, uh, to attest this. Can you have children while being an astronaut? And the answer is very clearly yes. <laughs> there is no showstopper. We um, astronauts are also uh, followed by a medical team of life surgeons, which are really specialized in space medicine, know perfectly the, the risk of space exposure. Uh, both for uh, male or female astronauts, we have experience in that domain and we fully support our, our astronauts. Um, astronauts are ESA staff. ESA is an organization which supports uh, the family, uh, family life of their, their staff. And if there, there is absolutely no, uh, no problem, no issue, no, um, no hiccup in, uh, in having to, or looking into having children. The, uh, it doesn't even stop uh, pregnant women at the time of the application to apply. I would really clearly say that it is not a problem. And even if uh, someone uh, become pregnant during the selection itself at any point in time and is selected because has the quality to become an astronaut, we will adapt the training schedule, especially for that person. So we are going very far in that direction and we we'll really try to be as supportive as possible. We, uh, as Antonella said before, we are also really looking for diversity. You uh, have been working uh, close to uh, astronauts for many, many years, I think. Uh, what are their activities on a daily? Uh... Okay, the, the, the life of an astronaut is obviously um, driven by, uh, by, by space mission, but space mission is not all the life of an, of an astronaut. We, uh, an astronaut in his career can expect to, to fly two, two or three times in, in space. And with the duration of the mission that we have, that's kind of a maximum too. But uh, a space mission, of course, has a certain duration. There is training before, there is preparation, there is um, a rehabilitation, and, and uh, also the experimental time after the mission. So it's, uh, of course, a space mission from A to Z to Z is also taking uh, quite a significant time. So that's close to, to three years, more or less. But and in between mission, astronauts also have a life. They are, of course, these people, these astronauts have an operational experience. They have no, even an operational expertise. So it's very important for for that they, for the program in general, that they convey back this experience into the program, into the project. So to really make them as good as possible. So of course there is a lot of training. There is a lot of um, of public um, public activities. Astronauts are very present in media. They are also requested a lot for intervention, public intervention or um, appearances. Uh, but there is also a lot of technical work. We call that in our jargon collateral duties. But it's uh, it's really an important part of their of their life. And really to uh, to bring back back this operational expertise to the project is absolutely essential. So they are working as engineers. They are working as experts. For the first time, we ESA has decided to introduce beside the astronaut corp. Uh, the uh, astronaut, the reserve, and also uh, the 
Paris to Not Feasibility project. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? I know also that we have questions huh, in the in the chat about the reserve and the, the Paris to Not Feasibility project and the two VNs uh, which have been uh, posted. I think you have said most of it. The the point I was really would like to emphasize is actually emphasize the 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 role of the reserve astronauts, even if they are not hired as staff and working full time as astronauts, is also to be more or less on standby. You never know when uh, an additional space mission can or, or for the flight opportunity can occur, and I think it's also important important for us to have um, those uh, reserve astronauts becoming and staying the ambassador of um, of exploration, space exploration, human spaceflight in their own country. Um, there are many countries with, um, which are member states of ESA, many more than what uh, how many assets we will be able to recruit this time so there will be a certain number of countries which might only have a reserve astronaut and not an astronaut uh, in, in the car for, for a given time so it's to to have that country being represented in the reserve is important for us to have these astronauts representing also ESA and human space exploration in the country is also important, and that's that's by experience and um, looking at what it has happened in the past, it is not anecdotal. It's really a role which can, when well done, can be very effective and can also be sometimes very demanding too. I would like to come back again also on the Parastronaut Feasibility Project, uh, on the medical... I will, I will give a very brief summary, at least I hope to be brief, yeah. summary on, on the genesis of the, the, the project. Um, the space medicine and the medical criteria to become astronauts, even this criteria, as I said, as becoming more fuzzy and less less sharply defined, there are still a number of uh, conditions, medical conditions, which are not expected to be accepted in uh, for an astronaut. And, and the reason is uh, is not only because uh, the first in 60 years ago we didn't know what happened in space, but also because we are somehow constrained by the vehicle itself. The space vehicles are um, really at the top of the technology of what we can achieve in terms of um, of uh, distance, of range, of uh, of size, of weight. And there are a number of conditions for which the the, the, the big vehicle are designed, which requires simply to have two hands, two foot, two feet, uh, to be able to run a, in case of an emergency, and all these aspects. So. Uh, some medical conditions are simply with not compatible with the vehicles as they are right now. So, because we wanted to uh, to enlarge, to open up the envelope, to to be more um, uh, welcoming and to have more diversity, we we would really like to open up the the possible conditions which are compatible with astronaut duties. But it is. Um, an absolutely tremendous project. There are not one disability, there are many different disabilities. And we had to be quite focused on the, in uh, defining a few that we would like to tackle first. And once we have solved the, those ones, then we will go further and address new ones. So that's the reason this project for the time being is limited to a, to a, a small scope of disabilities, very limited one. It's not because we don't want to go further, it's because simply it is not possible to do more at this time. For each of those disability, we will have to develop a program of testing, of verification, what kind of solution can we propose? How do we, with this verification, do we convince our international partners that we are right to, offer, to, to propose those persons also for space flight. And it is not a very easy job. That will be a lot of work which is coming to us and to my, and to my team in the future. And so it's really something where we do need to progress but to really go step by step. And that's the reason we have the, pro, the, 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 the astronaut selection designed the way it is. We will not be able to have those person as selected as full-time astronauts, but we would like really to have uh, to have a few in the reserve to have be our interlocutor into defining uh, what can be done and how it has to be done. So it is also not just to uh, to look nice. It's really because we want to to uh, to to find 
good interlocutors who can really help us in that endeavor. We have a, a, a question which is recurrent about the motivation letter and the length of the motivation letter. The motivation letter for us will, set, will, will be more looked at at the time where we are looking at individuals. So when the number of candidates has been re uh, reduced in the, the flow of the selection. So it will become very important when we are talking about psychological interviews, when we are talking about the professionals interviews. And that's where there will be face to face in contact between the candidates and the interviewers with the, with the panel. That if this letter, the content already tells us a lot about the person. So it better tell us a lot of good things and what is really, really interesting. But okay. again, I said, Antonella, be yourself. We yeah, don't, try to, don't try to, to trick the system. Antonella, do you have an advice for our uh, candidates, for our participants? First of all, uh, if this is something which speaks to your heart, just go for it. And uh, that it's also a very nice and interesting experience to be part of this uh, very um, unique selection. And this is also what uh, the current astronauts report to us. So they were really able to uh, also to, to make new friendships uh, throughout the full process. So it's really something which is worth, even if at the end, not anyone can become an astronaut. And then from a very practical point of view, please don't forget which are the essential documents that we kindly ask you to upload uh, once you have created your profile on the ESA Careers website. It is your CV in a Europass form, the motivation letter, of course, a copy of your valid passport, and the requested medical certificate. So either the European Path Med Class 2, uh, the one for the private pilot, pilot or uh, for the applicants for uh, the astronaut with a physical disability um, we are requesting um, a certificate issued in English by any physician uh, stating that if it were not for your disability you would comply with the medical requirements for the same uh, pilot, private pilot certificate certificate that we are requesting so please we really need all these documents. And then uh, the last thing that I can say is uh, good luck and uh, we would really uh, love meeting you in person sooner or later. I really believe that everybody who has um, the, the taste of it, wants to become an astronaut, who dreams of being, being an astronaut, should give it a try. That's really, the exp even the selection is an experience which will teach a, you, a lot uh, uh, to, to you all about yourself and that's something which is really really uh, um, yeah passionating it's re it's it's an experience you, if, that it has to be to be done at least once uh, twice is quite quite surprising but it's 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 a, we we have known that um, so please if you if you like it do it that's the best I can I can say you don't risk anything and uh, at the end you never know well, my advice is uh, be yourselves, okay, and follow your dreams. Um, that's important. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much again. Bye.